Have you ever noticed that a lot of stories start when the protagonist has to leave their home? Star Wars, Kingdom Hearts, even the Spongebob movie. Regardless of medium, it seems like countless stories rely on their main character being called away from home after some major tragedy, some big life event that changes that home forever. And that's because this is actually a really important piece of story structure. In Joseph Campbell's monomyth, The Hero's Journey, the first two stages are the call to adventure and subsequent refusal of that call, before the hero accepts their fate and journeys off. In each story, there's that initial refusal, before something changes and the the hero loses their home, deciding to go off on their adventure. But what I find far more interesting is stories about just the opposite. Stories where the hero comes home from a long journey only to realize that home is gone, or maybe never even existed in the first place. Stories where the facades of domesticity fall apart, revealing the cold skeleton of what once was. Stories about returning home to a home that doesn't really exist. Ever since my first playthrough of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, there's always been one very specific aspect that stuck with me. Throughout his entire life in Kokiri Forest, Link has never really fit in. One of the first few scenes in the game consists of you being blocked from your mission by Mido, him insisting that you aren't a real Kokiri. This is expanded upon even more in the manga. Link is a boy who doesn't belong, a Kokiri with no fairy, a Helion in the forest. When Link finally does make his way out of the forest, it is not by choice. The Great Deku Tree, the closest to a father figure Link had, is dead, and Link must leave the forest if he wants to save the rest of his home. He sets off, excited to explore the world, but with a lingering sadness that comes from leaving everything behind. Link ventures off into Hyrule where he acquires the two gems he needs to stop Ganondorf, but when he returns to the castle, he discovers he's already too late. Ganon has taken over, and Link has failed. Link's only option left is to retrieve the Master Sword and use it to fight Ganon, but upon pulling it comes the realization that he has failed once more. Seven years have passed instantly, leaving only the ruin of what once was. In that time, Ganon has seized complete control of Hyrule. Creatures of darkness roam the land, and an intimidating panopticon replaces the once welcoming castle of Hyrule. No area displays this more than the walk through Hyrule's former castle town, where people once danced and cheered, where lively crowds and happy children once roamed, is now full of re-deads, living husks, shells of people long gone. The buildings are falling apart, the air around them almost looks rotted. There is a pervasive emptiness you cannot escape, a permanent reminder of your failures. Later in the game, you can return to your past home of Kokiri Forest. However, this is not the Kokiri forest you remember. A dense fog covers the forest, blanketing the area in an eerie mist. Those you grew up with, those you would call your friends and family, are tucked away in their huts, unable to face the monsters outside. Saria, your childhood best friend, the person that mattered to you the most, the one person who made you feel at home, is dead. At the end of the game, after Ganon has been defeated, Zelda sends you back in time, telling you to go live your life. What does that even mean? Link has grown up, seen horrors beyond his own comprehension, failed again and again, watched as his world succumbed to ruin, and now he's just supposed to what, exactly? Go back to the forest and live his life? As an adult, Link knows he's a Helion, not a Kokiri now. Unlike all of his friends, he is cursed with mortality, the knowledge that he will grow up, he will get older, as all of them stay the same. The Kokiri forest is no longer a place for him. But then again, where is? The Kokiri forest has always been Link's home, but it's a place that he doesn't belong to anymore. The game ends with your fairy companion Navi abandoning you and Link meeting Zelda one final time. This is not the end of the journey for this Link, however. The opening of Majora's Mask sees him venturing through the forest, looking for Navi, his lost connection to both the Kokiri and his childhood. Link will never find Navi, though. Instead, he'll be cursed to wander forever, from place to place, 
growing up, never finding somewhere he truly belongs. He will go on until he dies, upon which he will still not be allowed to rest. This idea of waking up to a world you no longer belong in is not new to Zelda. Breath of the Wild would arguably take this the farthest, having Link awaken after a hundred years have passed, having failed to save those he cares about, losing even the memory of those he held dear. Much like in Ocarina, Link has once again been cursed with a permanent reminder that he failed. He couldn't live up to expectations, and he couldn't save everyone he was supposed to. For this Link, however, things are different. Much like in Ocarina, the land itself is a reminder of your shortcomings, but in that same desperation is a sense of healing. There are dense, lush forests, areas where nature has entirely reclaimed itself, camps of survivors fighting against monsters, a desperate plea to live, a reminder that though you failed, your fight is not over. There are still things you can save. Long thought to have been extinct, an ancient flower blooms in the fields, a reminder that even in a land of waste, there's always something to fight for. By contrast, Ocarina of Time has always remained in my head. Because where there is hope for Breath of the Wild Link, there's nothing but an empty future ahead for Ocarina Link. What makes Ocarina of Time's story so profound is that its fantastical narrative is grounded in real emotion. People come and go. Our closest companions leave sometimes without so much as a warning. We might discover who we always were, only to realize it doesn't matter in the face of who we are. Others might decide on our behalf that it's best to say goodbye, leaving us to pick up the pieces alone. Growing up means spending day after day with a friend just so they can suddenly go their own way. The Hero of Time's arc is a classic hero's journey, steeped in a profoundly human sadness. One of the most talked about parts of the Chronicles of Narnia series comes from the end of the first book. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Pevensi family have found themselves stranded in Narnia after saving it, and are crowned royalty. They live their entire lives in Narnia, become great and fair rulers, grow to be middle-aged adults, and then accidentally stumble through the wardrobe again. Suddenly, they're just kids. They were royalty, practically gods. They lived their entire lives, and now they're back here, teenagers and preteens once again. How do you go back to living a normal life after having already lived a better one? How do you go back to a world that you've forgotten? C.S. Lewis's following novel, Prince Caspian, takes this concept even further. After about a year back in our world, the Pevensi children are suddenly whisked back to Narnia. They find themselves on an abandoned island in the ruins of a once great castle. Rotted stone darts the ground, and great trees grow from the gates, this place having been deserted for hundreds of years. But as the Pevensis explore, Peter comes to a realization. This is Ker Paravel. This was their castle. Their reign as kings and queens of Narnia may have only been a year ago for them, but for Narnia, it's an age of the past. Even worse, what at first seems hundreds of years ago is revealed to be over a thousand. Not only is there no legacy left of the Pevensi's reign, there's nothing left of their friends. People they cared about, grew close to, trusted and loved for over 20 years, gone, without a trace, as if they never existed at all. People they looked forward to meeting once more in Narnia, people they dreamed of seeing again, even just to get a proper goodbye. They've returned to Narnia, but everything that made it Narnia to them is gone now. At the end of the book, the Pevensi children leave Narnia once more, again with the promise to one day return, but this time with the knowledge that the eldest two, Peter and Susan, cannot. One must be a child to enter Narnia, you see. With age, memory becomes more and more distant, almost as if it were a dream. Yes, that and other things, said Peter, his face very solemn. I can't tell it to you all. There are things he wanted to say to Sue and me, because we're not coming back to Narnia. Never? cried Edmund and Lucy in dismay. Oh, you two are, answered Peter, at least from what he said. I'm pretty sure he means you two get back someday. But not Sue and me. He says we're getting too old. Oh, Peter, said Lucy, what awful bad luck. Can you bear it? Well, I think I can, said Peter. It's all rather different from what I thought. You'll understand when it comes to your last time.
Gone Home is a game where you return from a year of study abroad only to find your family's house deserted. As the title states, it is a game directly about returning home. And what exactly defines said home? Considering the game revolves around this one house, a lot of detail went into defining what exactly it should look and feel like. Greasy pizza boxes lay around the living room, haphazard notes are scribbled near the answering machine, and the developer's commentary track even reveals the shockingly in-depth method of differentiating between handwriting styles, small changes that show what belongs to who. There's a subtle intimacy here, a familiarity in the complexity of its design. Gone Home's clever and subtle writing, as well as the environmental details, create a living and breathing setting. It feels like people live in the house. You can almost smell the empty pizza boxes and laundry detergent. That immersion is what made me connect to the family and pushed me toward clue after clue. It's what made me want to see the story through. It's your job to piece together what exactly happened to your family, and by finding voicemails, journal entries, and other daily memorabilia, you can do just that. Let me set the stage for you. Not too long after your departure to study abroad, your sister Sam falls in love with and begins dating a girl named Lonnie. She shows her old stories she wrote as a child, and Lonnie introduces her to anarchy and punk music. Things are going well, and though they can't be fully out of the closet yet, their relationship is happy. At some point, your parents discover Sam and Lonnie's relationship and essentially shun her, insisting it's just a phase, an experience I know all too well. I had an interesting talk with mom and dad tonight. One you were never gonna need to have. I mean, you've known, right? I've known. I've known since, like, she -Ra. Mom and Dad didn't, I guess. But they saw the zine and the stuff on the locker, and they were like, is there something we should know about you and Lonnie? And so here's the thing. I was prepared for them to be mad, or disappointed, or start crying, or something. But they were just in denial. You're too young to know what you want. You and Lonnie are just good friends. You just haven't met the right boy. It's a phase. That's what I didn't see coming. That they wouldn't even respect me enough to believe me. Well. Sam's parents ban them from seeing each other, but they continue their relationship in private, with the knowledge it will all soon end when Lonnie graduates and leaves for the army. At the same time, your parents' relationship isn't going so well, and they book a couple's retreat, leaving Sam home alone. The day finally comes where Lonnie has to leave, and Sam details how empty everything feels without her. The solitude and loneliness left behind in her wake, how she doesn't want her life to go on without her. But later, Sam gets a call from Lonnie, right before your call about your surprise return home. Lonnie changed her mind, and Sam runs off to be with her. The game ends with the reveal that the entire search you just played through was all flashback, Katie looking back on her journey through the house after having found Sam's letter. The title Gone Home is a double-edged sword here. Yes, you're physically returning home, but it also marks Sam's return home. Her realization that the place she thought was home wasn't, and her decision to leave with Lonnie. And let's just drive until we find somewhere for us. And she asked me if I could do that. And I said yes. Yes. The ending is marked with this bittersweet calm. We know that Sam and Katie won't see each other for a while, and yet there's a hope here. Sam and Katie are separate right now because home is pulling them in two different directions. But this change is for the better, this separation meaning they are both where they belong. And there's a promise here, the promise that someday in the future they will see each other again. A promise that this is not the end. Katie, I'm so sorry that I can't be there to see you in person that I can't tell you all this myself. But I hope as you read this journal, and you think back, that you'll understand why I had to do what I did. And that you won't be sad, and you won't hate me. And you'll just know that I am where I need to be. I love you so much, Katie. I'll see you again, someday. Love, Sam. One of my favorite games, 
and one I've already talked about at length, is Undertale. It's a game with plenty to love about it, but above all, I've always found this odd sense of comfort and home within it. Throughout the game, it's apparent that no matter where you go, you are home. This is it, right here with all your friends and friends-to-be. The game manages to make not only the settings, but the characters feel incredibly believable and well fleshed out. Toriel is a compelling character because despite all the mistakes she's made, at her core, she's a mother dealing with loss and trying to prevent a repeat of her trauma. She could literally be your next door neighbor. Sans is a guy who is initially just played for laughs. He's a chill, fun-loving dude who cares for his brother more than anything and shares puns in his free time. But throughout multiple routes, you discover that while this is still the core of his personality, he's been through a lot and that veil of puns and humor is his way of coping. Even minor characters and background characters are given an appropriate amount of weight and characterization. Even enemies you'll only ever see once are given the same amount of thought and care as the major protagonists and antagonists. The realism of the characters leads to this strange feeling I only ever seem to encounter in indie games like these, knowing the characters and truly caring about what happens to them in a way not unlike how you'd care for a real life person. And even in the harder segments of the game, it's as if both your friends and the world itself are cheering you on. No matter how hard an area is, there's always a save point. No matter how harsh the battle outside, there's always a rocking chair by the fireplace and a warm piece of pie in the kitchen. Home is a memory of the goodness of life. It is the reminder of a life well lived and the moments that have gone into living that life. Home is a reminder to smile, a reminder that there may be turmoil in the world, but you have a peace in you so you have a home. Home can be anywhere you make it, anywhere you find peace. Undertale is ultimately a game about player choice, a game where you decide what the ending is. But I don't think it's a coincidence that the only way to get the true happy end credits is to choose to leave it all behind and go live your life. In the final moments of the game, Toriel, a mother figure throughout the game, offers for you to come with her and live in the ruins. If you choose this, she remarks how it invalidates every other thing you've done, how your choice to not face reality is the one you could have made from the beginning, and had you, you wouldn't be where you are now. Choosing to stay with Toriel is a retreat, avoiding the word goodbye, avoiding everything else waiting for you. But choosing to leave and move on is what gives you the most fulfilling end. The promise that all of your friends are doing their own thing, living their best lives, with an infinite future ahead. In Deltarune, Toby Fox's follow-up to Undertale, there's a song that genuinely makes me sob. It's seemingly unintended, but every time, I can't hold myself back. It comes in the first few minutes of the game. As Chris, you head downstairs and Toriel, your mother in this world, asks if you're ready to leave for school. And as you ride in the old car down the street, a song begins to play. It starts strongly and sounds so familiar, yet so different. The vibes of the original game without the context. A hopeful theme, signaling the beginning of a new journey. Every aspect of the song feels adventurous and hopeful. You can't help but feel as if you're about to go on an incredible new journey. But as it goes on, suddenly it fades into a softer melody. As the Deltarune theme ends, it fades into his theme from Undertale, and you pass by a few of your old friends going about their lives. When you make it to the school, Toriel grabs your hand, leads you inside, and envelopes you in a familiar hug. It's almost like you're being welcomed back. Almost as if to say, they've all been waiting here for you. Sure, it's been a while and this world is different, but in any context, they're your friends. The song is titled, You Can Always Come Home, and it carries those same feelings of comfort and acceptance that Undertale did. A reminder that even somewhere new, the friends and family you've made, that feeling of belonging will follow you. 
It's a musical time machine that invites us to relive those tender moments and find solace in the familiar, like a hug from an old friend that you can't bring yourself to let go of. Even when this song just comes on in shuffle, no game, no video, no context, nothing, I have to sit with my feelings for a little bit. I almost always cry. I feel something deep in my gut like I'm safe, just for a little bit. It gives me something to feel, not quite happiness or joy, not anger, not sadness or even numbness, just safety, warmth. It's a brief period of comfort before you embark on a new journey, leaving behind that home once more. This past summer, I had the amazing opportunity to go and meet some of my closest online friends in person for the first time. These are people I've been close with for years, people I consider to be my best friends, and I was more excited than I think I've ever been. When we finally got there and they came to pick us up from the airport, it finally hit me that it was all real. Something I had dreamed of, joked about, something that had been on my mind for years was finally real. I was no longer staring at a screen, I was hugging someone, physically touching them, feeling the intimacy that comes with proximity. I'm very lucky. Not only in the sense that I didn't, you know, get murdered, but also in the sense that I've just fallen in with a really good crowd. My friends are also amazing. They're genuinely people I'm in awe of. They're genuinely kind and smart and artistic and funny and talented and just so, so incredible. We went to see one of my friends in a musical, and she was spectacular. Another friend played guitar with me while we were there, and all of us passed my camera around, sharing memories, giving permanence to what was, for me, one of the best weeks of my life. But it was only for a week, and eventually came time to leave. There was a night of deep talks, sad goodbyes, and lots and lots of tears from me. I didn't realize until we were leaving how deep the love I have for my friends is. And I didn't realize until we were on the plane back that in that week alone, I felt the most at home I had anywhere in my entire life. There's a certain wholeness I find being around my friends. I'm not scared to be myself in multiple ways. I can be stupid, I can be profound, I can joke around and just feel comfortable. I don't have to fear judgement, or that if I express an idea different from someone, they won't like me anymore. I can just relax and be me, without fear of rejection or mockery. Something I don't think I've ever really had at home. And every time I go back to read uh, a, com uh, a philosophy book, uh, The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus, uh, I'm gonna be thinking about Soda and Lainey. And every time Death by Glamour or a Dark Souls song comes on, I'm gonna be thinking about hanging out with you guys in the car, and the day on the beach, and when I put the fucking sea salt spray into my hair <laughs> at the start of every day when I'm doing my routine, I'm gonna think about this, this, the, the ocean breeze from the water, and when I, when I wash my face with the soap soda gave me, I'm gonna think about just how great it all was. And I think it's really important to cherish that. It's been a little under four months since I got back now, and I don't- I don't know how to live anymore. I don't know how to go back to my life. I still wake up and expect for a second to be on my friend's couch. I expect to turn my head and see other friends curled up on the air mattress across the room. I join calls with them and get choked up just at the thought of how much I miss them, at the fact that we aren't right next to each other. I miss- more than anything, I miss being able to hug them. I miss having late night tea parties and watching movies. I miss struggling to operate the sandwich machine at the gas station. I miss the familiar chords of my friend's song on guitar. I even miss when I pretty much blew up their dishwasher. On my final night in Jersey, just before we were scheduled to get on our flight, there was a tearful night of heartfelt speeches on the couch, and my friend played a beautiful song on their guitar. I just remember sitting there, tears streaming down my face, desperate for just a little bit longer. I think more than anything else, I'm scared of the possibility that I might not have that again. I've spent the past months of my life stuck on this, realizing that when I returned to my actual home, the house I grew up in, I felt like I had actually left my home. 
I felt like I left the place I belonged more than anywhere else. When I returned from Jersey, I returned to stay a few weeks with my parents in my childhood home. I still don't really know how I feel about that home. Even as a kid, there were things that made it not home to me. Things that made it scary, terrifying even. I spent most of my time there holed up in my bedroom, doing my best to make it a comforting place for me. When I moved out of that house, I told my parents they could give my room to my sister. Not because I didn't want it, not because I never planned on visiting, but because I planned on coming out as gay to them. For years, I had grown accustomed to the idea that after coming out, I would likely be kicked out of my home. So when I moved, I was ready for it. I packed everything that I wanted to keep that I couldn't bear to risk losing. Even though my parents assured me that I didn't need to take so much to my college dorm, their house could still be home for me. I knew in a few months they would not be echoing that sentiment. My relationship with my parents is still rough after coming out, but I am allowed to stay at their house again. I do fairly often for most holidays, and each time I realize how empty the place feels to me. And after coming back from Jersey, it felt even more empty. My parents had just renovated the kitchen, bathrooms, and the entire downstairs, and while it was pretty, it didn't feel like people lived in it. The spaces I grew up with had disappeared, and it felt like they'd been replaced with, in the words of my sibling, an IKEA showroom. When I left Jersey, I left behind one of the greatest times in my life for a gutted out remnant of my past, a version of my childhood home that was not home to me anymore. Every time I go back for the holidays, I find myself realizing that the place I'm imagining in my head isn't the place I'll be arriving to. Though I'd like to cook in my childhood kitchen, sit and play guitar on the familiar shag carpet I grew up with, I will never do either of those things again. The space just… doesn't exist anymore. And even if it did, the version of it in my head has been romanticized and glamorized, now so far removed from the truth that I might not even recognize the past uncomfortability of these spaces anymore. The comfort I'm still clinging to isn't there. And it might have never been. When you head home and realize your past has outgrown you, it's incredibly lonely. It's like heading into the world without that safety net. The place we once held close when homesickness and when nostalgia took over, doesn't exist anymore. It's no longer a tangible destination. It exists only in our memories and sentimental reflections with old friends. No longer is there that comforting notion that if everything were to fall to pieces we'd have our old home to fall back on. All of a sudden, we are left alone with our future plans, goals, and dreams. We look at home as something that's been fortified for us, rather than something we create. There's still this deep emptiness inside me been trying to face. That time I had with my friends was so special, and even though I knew it was going to be short, I didn't think leaving would be so hard. Maybe part of it is because of that intimacy, that proximity of being right next to each other and seeing them in person made me realize just how much I cherished them. There's a feeling of loss that comes afterwards. But here's the thing, I know this isn't goodbye. My friend taught me how to play their song on guitar, and though I've forgotten some of it, it seems like I almost always wander over to those two chords I remember, and feel at peace again. I have gifts given to me by my friends, physical reminders that they care about me. I printed out the photos we took and stuck them on my wall right above my desk so I can always look up and see them smiling back at me when I feel lost. I left a sock in my friend's dryer specifically so that I would know I had to go back eventually. And even then, I've been planning on transferring to the Philadelphia area to finish college next fall, somewhere far closer in proximity to my Jersey pals. I know that it isn't goodbye forever, but there's still this feeling in the meantime. Link sets off after losing everything, but with the promise that someday, somewhere out there, he will make a good life for himself and the children stumble out of Narnia back to their ordinary lives with the knowledge that goodbye is not forever, and they will one day return to be kings forevermore. Katie acknowledges that she and her sister will meet again someday, and that their temporary separation will ultimately be more fulfilling for both of them. And I leave New Jersey, with tears streaming down my face. But tears that only come from the unbearable joy and pain of being fully known and loved for your true self. A goodbye that seems like forever, but 
tinged with the kind of bittersweet memory that makes you realize that not only are you alive, but you have hope. And even if it's a people and not a place, and even if it's far away, and even if you can't be there right now, there's always a home for you somewhere. If you like this video, there's now an exclusive companion to it where I cook the pie from Undertale, available now on Patreon to $3 and up tiers. Had a lot of fun recording this, and well, I hope it gets watched. So uh, if you like, hop over to Patreon and join for $3 or above to see cooking video. So you don't get to see the pie because yeah. we messed it up. It probably tastes like shit anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for watching! One uh, uh for recording all of these. Uh, Idiots, uh, me included, uh, in what has been, I think, an excellent trip. Um, and I think there's something to be said that, like, even though memories are I important. still have another box! <laughs>